everyone. This is the first video that I am assigning for homework for the semester. Uh, make sure that you do fill in the notes because um, there is going to be a quiz at the beginning of class tomorrow. So it's very important that you complete those notes so that you can get credit for this assignment and also so that you're able to take the quiz. Um, this video is going to be on the forces of change, the things that change um, the landforms and uh, change the landscape of the earth. So there's uh, internal forces and external forces that we are going to discuss. And when we talk about internal forces, uh, we're talking about what is happening inside of the earth that shapes the outside of the earth. We need to talk about the continental drift theory. If you've taken a science class before, you might have heard this, uh, but continental drift theory is um, the theory that the continents are big land masses that are floating above the Earth's surface. And that at one point, Earth used to be made into a supercontinent, and it eventually broke apart and started drifting away from each other millions of years ago see if this animation works. All right, so now you can see how it used to look as it starts moving closer together. So this is going back in time, and you can see how it used to be a supercontinent and how that continent was formed. All right, so none of this has been proven scientifically, um, but there are, scientists are pretty, pretty sure that this is how the continents that we have today came to be. And so it's just a theory, and some people dispute it, but for the most part among the scientific community, um, there is agreement that there used to be a large continent and that it has drifted apart in um, recent, in recent uh, millennia. Okay, so internal forces. Why should we care about internal forces? Well, it's important that we understand them because they shape the Earth's surface by building and changing landforms. Um, these forces and can also alter the lives of humans um, if they feel um, the effects of the internal forces, and I'll explain how. So plate tectonics are used to describe how um, the plates are moving um, on top of the Earth's mantle. There are seven major plates that we study and they are pictured here in the diagram and then there are several little uh, small ones that are also sort of important. Um, again, they move on top of the uh, mantle. They are part of the lithosphere, that's part of the outer crust of the Earth um, and they shape our landforms. Those tectonic plates move in four ways. Um, one way that they could move is through spreading. They start to move apart horizontally, and when they move apart, that hot magma that's underneath the crust rises. And when it rises into the ocean, it begins to cool. And as it cools, it forms new crust. Eventually, that crust might even rise above the water, creating new islands. Subduction is another way in which the plates might move. And subduction means that one plate will dive under another plate, and that often causes mountains to form on the land. Another way in which tectonic plates move is through collision. That means that they can crash into one another. Now, we don't always feel those crashes um, because they are moving slowly, but it does happen. And then there is the transform. That's the last way in which the plates move. And that is when the plates are grinding past each other. When they move, they slide past each other and they create some friction. Um, there's two types of boundaries where the plates are meeting. Um, there's diver divergent boundaries, which means they're moving apart. 
and then there are convergent boundaries and the where there are convergent boundaries the plates are actually coming together and this creates different kinds of landforms so here is an, a diagram of the sea uh, floor spreading in the mid-atlantic ridge which is in the atlantic ocean at the bottom of the ocean floor there is a little gap where the ocean plates um, where the plates the eurasian plate and the north american plate are moving apart and as they move apart there is that hog magma rising to create new ocean floor Right. Here's another diagram that's explaining um, how volcanic eruptions can happen as well. So here's the, uh, the mid-ocean ridge rift where the seafloor is spreading. Um, the plates are moving. That magma is always rising and it's creating rocks and younger um, ocean floor here. Um, on this side, you can see how there is a volcanic mountain range that has been uh, created and the magma can also rise through those in volcanic eruptions. So volcanoes are magma, gases, and water from the lower part of the crust that have accumulated um, underground in underground chambers. And the volcano is the place where the magma, gases, and water are going to pour out of the Earth's surface. Most volcanoes, actually 95% of them, are found along the tectonic plate boundaries. That's usually where they are formed. And those boundaries are called the ring of fire. That's the zone around the rim of the Pacific Ocean where all these volcanoes and faults are located. Here is a diagram of the ring of fire. So where all of these little red triangles are, those are volcanoes, right? And underneath those are tectonic plate boundaries. Earthquakes occur when plates are grinding or slipping past each other and they're causing a lot of tension. The epicenter of, a, of an earthquake is the location in the earth where the actual earthquake begins. Um, then we use the information that we gather from a Richter scale um, to measure the strength of the earthquake. So the seismograph is what measures the strength of the um, of the earthquake and then we give it a number and that number will fall somewhere along the Richter scale. So sometimes it's a very um, very light earthquake and so it might only get like a one or a two and then the most uh, devastating earthquakes are usually um, you know seven or eight on the scale. And then tsunamis are a result of those earthquakes. And those are giant waves that form in the ocean and they're caused by that, that shaking in the ground. Um, they, they disturb the water and it creates a giant wave that sometimes reaches land. So now that we talked about internal forces, let's talk about what's happening on the outside, the external forces. External forces include wind, heat, cold and glaciers and how they alter the earth's surface. The results of weathering and erosion change the way that humans interact with their environment. So it's important that we understand those external forces. When we talk about weathering, weathering is the chemical or physical processes that change the characteristics of rock on or near the Earth's surface. A very important definition for you to know. It's the chemical or physical processes that change the characteristics of rocks. There's two kinds of weathering. We have mechanical weathering and chemical weathering. In mechanical weathering, what happens is the rocks are broken down with a chemical found in nature. Essentially, they're torn apart by force rather than by a chemical breakdown. In chemical weathering, this is caused by a chemical reaction that the rock has had with some sort of chemical in the earth. So you have things like salt that wear down the, the rocks that are near the ocean. That is chemical weathering. After a rock has been weathered, erosion can take place. And erosion is the result of weathering on matter. So after a rock has been weathered, either chemically or mechanically, erosion occurs. 
and that is when the the material that has broken apart is moved. So erosion is the movement of that material by some transporting agent. And the material can be moved by wind. So sometimes the wind transports the sediment to other locations and deposits it there. Sometimes, depending on the type of wind-borne sediment, new landforms can be produced um, when, when the sediment is moved with the wind. Glaciers can also be formed through erosion. So the mass of ice that moves because of gravity from the highest point to the lowest point, that is also erosion. And then water. Water moves a lot of the sediment as well. So in rivers um, and oceans, th that the material that starts breaking down due to the weathering is moved through water. And it, it takes all that loose material down the stream, and then sometimes it dissolves the chemical elements. And um, again, the wave actions going in and out of the shore, they're moving that sand in and out of the, um, the beaches, and so that is also known as erosion. And then we need to know about soil building. When weathering and erosion are part of a process um, that builds the soil, and that is because a variety of soils and the climates in which they are found determine the type of vegetation that could grow in a location. So it's very important that we understand that weathering and erosion are essential to creating fertile soil where we can grow vegetables and other crops. And that concludes our slideshow. Um, if you have any questions, make sure that you write them down and ask me at the beginning of class. And thank you for watching. Oh, and also don't forget that you need to complete those notes. So if you miss something, go back in this video and fill it in and prepare for having a quiz tomorrow at the beginning of class having to do with this lecture. All right, thanks.